for as part of as part of surveillance and these national studies. So it's the importance of this data that is the main thing. And the, the more data we can provide, the more inference that we can give on, on surveying this virus and, and, and the, 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 the impact it's had on all of our lives. So we'll talk firstly about building national sequencing. So the formation of COG started was, was back in the 10th of January 2020 when the first SARS-CoV genome was published. And then into the back end of January, the Arctic Outlook on Sequencing Protocol was published to look directly at that. Arctic was set up to look at things like Zika and Ebola. It was easy to trans, well, not easy. It was, a, it was an ability to translate that towards, and, and towards um, SARS-CoV-2. Then on the 11th of March, UK Genomic Sciences met to talk about how they look at this. And Sharon, Sharon Peacock spoke about that this morning. And then literally as it moves through then till the, the 19th and 20th is when we reached out you know, we were due to lockdown as well, and, and we'd spoken to colleagues in the region and, 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 and colleagues further afield, and they, they described this consortium that was being set up um, to survey um, the population of virus that, that was due, well, due to hit our shores. And very quickly, we, we were brought in as the Northern Sequencing Hub. So as you can see, there's, 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 there's 16 regional sites. It's directly linked in with the, the largest um, sequencing hub in the nation, the Sanger Center, which is funded by Wellcome. And then but one of the key things of this is that the four public health agencies are associated with that. So you have the data and the sequencing from all of those different areas. Alongside that, then you have the support from UKRI, which was the initial funding part of this study, which was a 20 million pound investment um, for the fighting fund for H from HMT COVID-19 fund. And then later, as we moved into April, there's a further fund of 12.2 million um, from uh, public health. That's now UK HSA. So we are sat in the northeast of England, but you know our spread had to be quite big to cover our region. You know we we, we stretch as far down as, as North Yorkshire and stretch as far as stretch far, as far up through Northumbria to the borders. Alongside that, you know Cumbria is such a vast county that you know we we also had to support North Cumbria uh, Integrative Care, which is the, the trust right at, at the borders. Uh, between uh, North Cumbria and Scotland. So alongside all of these NHS sequencing labs providing or being hubs for their regional, the, the hospitals taking samples in for testing, you also have the UK Lighthouse Network that was also talked about this morning. We have members here that are, are linked through to the h &E site over at Gateshead. This means you have samples coming in through, through the NHS sites and you have some samples coming in through pillar two. But what that means is variation in sample type. And one of the things that Sam talked about this morning was that direct acquisition of RNA samples. We were quite unlucky in this fact that we had inactivated samples. So there was an upstream extraction of RNA before we, we pushed ours into the pipeline. So we would have both RNA coming from some sites and also inactivated lysates coming from others. So we would take that sample we would prep it, it would be sequenced, and then the data would be pushed onto MRC CLIMB um, that, that Ewan spoke about this morning. There's this unbelievable, fan, fantastic rep repository of, for, of data that links both sequencing data um, to the supportive metadata that gives you the value in looking at this work. Downstream of that, this data is then pushed to NHS and also the other public health agencies to allow them um, to make decisions on, on, on um, may, maybe uh, variants of concerns, variants of, of interest, and also that surveying the population and, and the, the, the depth within uh, that community. So there's an aim of COG to be open and transparent. I mean, to get this data and make it very open, with the ability to grab this data, you know, sequence this data, and with, with supportive data, allow that to people so they can do downstream analysis. Because we've seen by having this open view and this open approach to sequencing, what we've been able to achieve, which is now over a million sequences uploaded to CLIMB. The sequencing from COG builds into a number of studies. This is not just this is not just Northumbria, but this is like an, an overview of, of what COG has fed into. And you know, there's, there's, there's targeted sequences associated with severe disease. And very early on, when we were trying to get samples from sites, we wanted to see the most severe cases to see if we could associate uh, lineages so with, 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 with the downstream um, 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 impact of infection when it's at its worst. Looking to people who had vaccination and vaccination failure after one or two jabs. And these studies have, have gone on now for, for the whole piece since the vaccinations have, have, been, have been offered. 
um, to the population. Importations is a big one because when we looked back to pre-lockdown, we, 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 we know that there was an influence into the community from other countries associated with, with, with barrel lineages. And that we've seen how we've become, um, uh, over certain periods, smelting pots of, of, of viral lineages. Then all of a sudden we'll see one, one with an evolutionary advantage that will take off within a population. So COG has, has been ONS react, vaccine trials, genomic, which, which is trying to link the host genome to the virus and others, care homes and prisons. And we, we've been associated with some of these and, and Yusri later on this afternoon will talk about our, 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 our part of our study that we, we were part of a study with Judy Brewer uh, from UCL. That's the Hokey study. And that was looking to utilize genomics to inform clinical decisions when, when you have infection in the hospital setting. So to date, over 1.2 million viruses. And then the aim of this was to, to sequence above 10% of, of, of the people that are positive in the country. And, and in, over parts of the pandemic period, we've been able to sustain that well above that closer to 50%. So why is, why is this important? You know, so this is a schematic um, from uh, um, um, the Cognitation Explorer, which is one of the utility tools that has been coded by um, uh, members of the of the COG um, group, both from um, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and and other other parts of the of, of the COG um, network, you can see very early on here in pink that there's a basically you have a, a, a distribution of other variants. But all of a sudden, when we get to December of 20, then you start to see the influence of this green colour, which is is basically the alpha variant that was kind of originally was meant to come from Kent. And then we see then as we get to May, then all of a sudden the, the uh, Delta strain, which is the blues, takes over. We would not have this resolution without this sequencing. We would just say, oh, yes, the SARS-CoV is still is circulating. It doesn't give the ability then to take that sample and look at um, you know, transmissibility, you know, to, to link that data back to, to, to comorbidities and look to, to things that would inform a little bit of how, how these viruses transmit within the populations. You can break this transmission as well in the mix between alpha and delta, you know, by, by region. And then this is quite, the, these, are, these are published um, monthly uh, by the UK HSA. And this is the, the week 40 surveillance. And, and it was anecdotally when we were sequencing and looking at the viral lineage that we were seeing from our sequencing hub, that actually when we, usually you would see it in Liverpool two weeks before we saw it in, 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 in the Northeast. And you would probably see it one week in before in Sheffield, before we saw it in the northeast, and you can ju just about see that signature between the northeast and northwest. So, when we look to the different labs, you know that you've got seven different trusts, seven different sites, all all using different ways of even testing for SARS-CoV-2. That means that the logis there's a logistical nightmare within this is that some sites will provide you with RNA, some sites will provide you with in inactivated lysates. Some samples, um, so South Tees and, and North and Northumbria have been two sites with the Hologic Panther. You know, that, that the, once you have the sample in, in, in the lysis buffer, then we found it very, very diff difficult to retrieve any sequence data back from. So we had to go back to South Tees and, and Stephen, is part, who's, who's here today as part of the research team, kind of got in touch with the lab and said, can we have a, a second sample? And that was the only way we were going to be able to recover and get good coverage of, of these genomes from South Tees is by getting that, that second sample and by having this close collaboration with these, with each of the different trusts, we were able to do that. So the protocol that we've used, and we've, we've now moved to something slightly different to this, but you know, the one that we started off with used, used the, um, uh, the Oxford Nanopore grid iron, and then later, later on for more batch sequencing, we moved on to the, onto the Illumin I mean, these are two sequences that were, were funded by um, the E3 HBBE funding, which we received probably just not many months before the start of the pandemic period, which allowed us then to upscale to use this. I don't want to go into too much detail of this because it was covered mostly by Josh earlier on, but what it is is, is a tiled amplicon PCR with two pools that cuts, that spans the genome, and then you sequence you you basically pool them um, and sequence them, and, and, and then the downstream analysis that Matt will talk about later on today. The two methods that we used was Corona hit and the Arctic low cost. That the, these these two methods were, you know, one 
we've used for Illumina and the Arctic protocol, the low cost we use for the ONT platforms. But this was about driving down the cost per sample. That actually, when we try, if we try to move this, you know, lower the cost per genome to, 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 to get more bang for your buck, say, then, then th these were the ways to go. So downstream of your sequencing, when you have your, you know, your data has come off, there are certain pipelines associated with that. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how that data is analyzed in a moment. But that data then goes to, to, the, to the climb COVID. I mean, this is the place where we send separately our sequencing data and the metadata where at one point they, ca they can be linked to give you the utility downstream. I don't want to go into too much again with this because you even spoke more about it this morning. But, I mean, I think um, the, the talk just before the last session um, from, from Rachel showed us the actual, what the impact of the informaticians that have been associated with this, this, this um, network in the, the, the amount of tools that they've generated that's allowed us to go into, into um, um, a, popula a population of variants and, 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 and viruses and, and compare them at, at, at a genotype level. So are they identical? Are they slightly different? And then what you can do by, by analyzing two people maybe that are in, in, in the same vicinity, that if their genotypes are exactly the same, that there may have been transmission. If they're different, then there's not been transmission. And what you have is two in, different incidences of the virus that, that's entered that setting. So that's really important for, not, for both infection control, but also trying to, to look at the, the transmissibility of a virus and how far it's stretched. So it's a massive team effort. I mean, you know, a lot of this has been done on, on the bounce. You know, we were, we were given methods that work and what you have to do is work them up in, in the setting that you are. So it's not, it's not just, it's not easy to translate something straight from, from, a, from a method into something that's, that's logistically heavy with, with getting enzymes, kits, plastics in all at the same time. So we, had a, we set up a workflow and the workflow's here. Of receiving samples either from um, either from that needed inactivating or those that had RNA, and they both filtered through two different uh, two different routes through to the system onto the sequencer, and then through our HPC quick onto Clam COVID. Downstream of this, you know, you know, we've we've added utility to this because. Um, Matt, who, who kind of leads the informatics side of this, has, has added value in, with some of the pipelines uh, because the output of it, outputs um, are fantastic, but it's sometimes quite difficult for people who probably aren't coding to see the outcome of that sequencing data. So, how much, how, what percentage coverage of the virus can you see? How much percentage is, is not called? You know, what lineage is called at the back end of it? But to have it all in that one space is really helpful for the people either in the lab or when you're trying to disseminate data. He's also done some work looking at, 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 at negative and contamination, uh, contamination negative controls and has put together this AMP QC. It's a program that compares contamination and the negative well ac across the plates that you're sequencing. So it's a massive undertaking and it's been undertaken by a team that's kind of been really dedicated. We've said that, you know, you know this virus stole Christmas when Alpha came in. And actually, we weren't, we weren't sequencing alpha over the Christmas period, but actually what we were sequencing is sewage samples because there was, there was a thought that we could use sewage samples for early detection of, of viruses within populations. And, you know, and so we were doing that as well while everybody else was sequencing the alpha variants. So, I mean, there are two bigger, you can see the people around here. So, you know, you've got Andy, Greg, Claire, John, Rui, Zach, Will, Wen made a guest appearance. And then Matt and Matt, two Matts then for the bioinformatics side of things. And then from the epidemiology side of it, um, Steve Rushton across the road, Roy Sanderson and Sarah O'Brien have been invaluable in, in, in how to analyze the, all of this data we, we pulled together over the period. And there's the post from the lab. I'm never on any of these photographs, I've noticed. <laughs> so then that's not just the lab team that makes this work. It can't, you know, there has to be the collaboration between, between the clinical sites. I mean, we've been, it's been invaluable that the people, there's been, a, there's been a person or a few people at each site that have kind of taken this by the horns and driven, you know, the ability for us to get the samples. You know, it takes quite a long time to, 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 to get approval. 
you know, and I think any any week or month that's, uh, that that goes by, it means that you're not sequencing data for that region, and therefore you're missing out on something. So, like, there's lots of gratitude to Yusri from from the Newcastle side, Stephen, just because the two in front of us but, um, regarding really driving at each of your sites to make sure that we could get the data uh, and and the samples. The same again with with Clive in North Cumbria, uh, Kevin in North Cumbria Trust, Jonathan Moore at Gateshead. Uh, Emma Swindles, the very start of it in Hartlepool. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it can't be just seen as a Northumbria sequencing because without the samples and without getting them in within a certain amount of time, it, it makes the makes the sequencing irrelevant. But also, there has to be big thank yous for internal people as well because without the kind of support of the the, the exec, because you know during the COVID time we had to um, actually ask whether we could come in. You know, to, to the university because the university as such was closed down. But you know, the faculty were very, and the, the exec faculty department was very, very supportive in, in, in making sure that we were working, you know, to, to, to the best of our abilities to, to, to work within this within this network. That goes to say, alongside that, there's new contracts that needed to be signed. There was procurement that needed to be sorted out. There's tender exemptions that need to be looked at. You know, there's, there's the compute side of it. You know, Jimmy sat here now, but he saved our our lives on about two or three occasions with with with, with certain things I've gone on, you know, with respect to the, the, the HPC over, over over the time. So health and safety, you know, the health and safety, we had to be trained to we had to be trained to drive the cars to go and pick the samples up. We had to be able to, to, to fill out all the new forms associated with, with working under co and under the COVID safety conditions within the university. And that has been really well supported by by the health and safety team. We wouldn't have be allowed access into the building without the security team and John Anderson and team have been amazing at, at, at being very, very kind of helpful with us, even to the point of letting us use the vans associated with going round of the local sites to pick up samples because the courier costs were so expensive. So if we if we look then, you know, you know, if you look to the to the data that's been generated by COG to this point, and you know, this is going to get bigger. You know, there's already 60 high-ranking publications, and the way that the authorship has been set up is that all people that are associated with COG are put on, um, uh, basically, in the supplementary with with what they've done as part of their role in COG, and therefore they they conform to, to have that middle authorship, and that's been a very big part of driving this forward from 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 um, the management and, and the steering group of of, of COG. But it, some examples of of where the, the, the sequencing data has been important. You know, the, 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 there's the study here looking at the, how many admission, um, uh, transmission lineages within over a very short period of time between March and April 2020. And you can see that there was over 1,200 transmission lineages that, that were moved, and you can see the multiple countries that, that they, their invent came from. So we we're expecting, you know, so blocking people down and making sure that the borders are closed. You know, we, we can see here that there is utility in doing that to try to stop the spread over those certain periods. I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail because Matt will talk more about, you know, the, about the the, um, the phylogeny side of this. But you know, the utility of the data is that you have the ability to to see and identify two identical things. And this was a study by um, Emma Watson and led by Esther Torek at Cambridge, and they were looking at uh, people who come every other day to, to a renal dependency unit to, and, and because of their cycle patterns going in and out of those labs to have dialysis and the, the lineage they could show that the, there was transmission in that site and they could see them from between the, the different days that they showed up that the, the, they could see different lineages so that you could actually marry the epidemiology to the actual viral sequencing. And then we, we and then back at Christmas time, the virus that stole Christmas uh, that has been described as the day, the alpha variants. You know, you know, COG was one of the it was the first one to, to to describe this virus and its rapid increase within the population alongside the the, the, the sites doing PCR and seeing the S gene dropouts. And again, this is one of the, 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 the one of the tools that was designed by uh, Jeff Barrett and his team down at Sanger, and it shows you over time. So from September, October, November, you start to see the increase of B117 as a part of the viral population that we're sequencing, and then 40 to December, December, February, and it can completely saturated 
Um, so it was basically like Groundhog Day. Every sequencing run was alpha. And now towards the now it's every every sequencing run is delta. Delta is slightly different because there seems to be a lot more variation with the, within that that viral genotype. That means that there's 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 more uh, mutations associated with the spike protein and maybe genes associated with uh, further transmissibility. So when we talk about support of infection control, you know, when we, if we took our the, the amount that we've sequenced and 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 what's uploaded to, to GizAid, because all of the data that we, we put through, if it's above a certain quality, it gets pushed through to GizAid, and it's also the data stored on the European Nucleic Acid um, database. That actually, you know, we're, we're you know, 25,000 on there is probably about 22nd on that list. So if you think of a, of a, of a, of a global number of sequences that, that we've achieved as, as a group, then that's what we've achieved. So we've, we've inferred on, on, on 25,000 patients associated with the viral genotype they've been carrying. If we look at the list then to the left, then it's, we, we see it was over 11,000 from, from pillar one associated with the hospital. I mean, that's um, a smaller part of this, but I think it's, 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 it, was the, it was the bigger challenge because we had to do the upstream extractions before we sequenced those samples. If you look at what we've, we've helped, so we, did, we didn't feel it right to be sure to, to, to infection data regarded hospitals as hospital side by side. So we ju we're just going to have a quick overview of what we've supported. And we've tracked regional transmission in care homes, you know, and we've, we've probably tracked probably 50 care homes over a 16 month period. And some of that was presented as part of a, of a SAGE report. Uh, we, we were supporting two studies, one from an informat informatics side. Um, from the SIPS, which is basically COVID in prison study. And also, we, 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 because of the, the samples came through um, Yusri, uh, Yusri's lab and associated with Shirelle, and we were able, to, we were able to, to access those samples and look at regional prisons. We've looked at local um, um, uh, public health. You know, when there was, there was an outbreak in Holt Whistle, we've looked to see at, at the spread of that also looked at um, the Delta variant outbreak in, in Tyneside, which is one of the first ones in the Northeast. And also we've looked at in, in, immunosuppressed patients with chronic infection. So you mean that we've, we've built into a lot of different clinical studies or, or offered some data that would support some clinical um, outcome, you know, or would give some added value to, to the data that, that we've not just a yes, no, um, the person was infected with, with, with COVID-19, the virus that COVID-19. In April of this year, if you saw the, the, the talk earlier on today when it showed the inference of data using the same kind of tool I've just showed for um, B117, actually you saw a little flash of purple in one part of that. And that's because very early on in the piece that we saw uh, the Delta variant in the, in the north of England. And what we did notice is that it was very different to the Delta variants that had been, that, that had been kind of talked about in the rest of the country. And that was used then as part of the, the discussion of, of kind of broadening um, creating sub lineages a few days, a few days later, that maybe we weren't a part of those discussions, but the data that we sequenced were a part of <coughs> helping uh, make those decisions. One of the big parts about this is that some of these studies were associated with Delta. When when there was inference of data, Delta in, in in the hospitals from a presumed person who'd come back from from India or from from a holiday, we 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 were taking samples and turning them around from from sample extraction sequencing within 16 hours. I mean, so that, that's almost at a level that could, can, can be used um, to, to help make decisions, especially with infection control. So what are the future directions of COG? So um, COG as, as a network has uh, as stopped sequencing now, but you know, that's not the end of COG. COG will move to be um, a, a, a research network. And, and Sharon discussed you know, kind of said which areas this maybe which maybe go towards something like AMR, which would be a really great way to kind of use the the the, the knowledge base and the and the expertise um, in this area if, into the future. So last but not last but not least, that, that's the, the stock slide that everybody's been shown. But uh, you can see all of us on the or most of us on the mat at the bottom with his thumbs up, me with my glasses on because I couldn't see anything, blind as a bat. And then at the top, you've got Andy and Greg in the hoods. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for your support. I think for all the people in here as well. So thank you.
how she poses, but. No, that's okay. Okay, so um, following on from Darren's talk, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things we did to support local infection control teams. So really, this is the beast. This is the whole entire genome of the virus, which has caused uh, so much problems within the world. And really what we get, and this is the, the Wuhan you know, reference genome, what we get back is an individual or several characters that are, that are different. So there'll be a different DNA base, or there'll be a deletion or an insertion. But by itself, that sequence isn't really useful. It doesn't really tell us what's going on. So we have to do something with that that's useful clinically. So it's not really infection control, but one of the first things we can do is to report back on what the lineage is, what strain or variant of the virus is it. Um, and so this is kind of important for answering questions, particularly for people who might have suddenly presented again with another infection. Is it the same virus that they were infected with previously? Is it, is it you know, a new infection with a different variant? And it's also important, what Darren mentioned in, in, in sort of following along, people who are immunosuppressed who might not be able to clear the virus from their system because they've been having treatment for, say, leukemia or something like that. And there's also sort of uh, cases where people were very concerned about, particularly when new variants came, such as the Kent or Alpha variant or the Delta variant, about reporting what particular sort of you know, variant of concern they have. And interestingly, the Delta variant itself so sort of, is now being split into 40 different sublineages some of which in turn have sub sub lineages. So there's an awful amount of, of variation we're still looking at there. And indeed the most popular variant right now in the UK is called AY4. So it's still a constantly developing and evolving situation. But one of the most interesting things we can do with genomics is to kind of pinpoint whom infect whom, to, to put it quite, quite frankly. Uh, and, and one approach that we, that we used and we'd heard some talks this morning um, about a tool called Civit is to use phylogeny. And essentially what that is, is we make a hereditary tree of all the viral genomes and we, we map them into this tree, each of the samples we've received, and we can work out which samples are related to each other and in what way. Um, so some of you may be familiar with phylogy, some of you may not. The sort of classic example is this sort of tree of life where we have bacteria, archaea and eukaryota. And where, where right there on the, the very far, far right here is, is animals and fungi. And we also have an example on this other side of just sort of a, a, a sort of an example of how a, a phylogenetic tree works. And, and in this very top case, in, in sort of the top clade in cyan, we have sort of uh, samples C and D, which share a common ancestor B. Um, equally, there's, there's another clade on the bottom where we have H and I, which share a common ancestor G. So this is essentially what we do with all of the different sequences that we receive or, or, we, or we sequence from the samples from the hospital. They get mapped onto a tree. Now, as we heard this morning, generating the tree, I mean, Previously, the biggest sort of generation of a tree they'd used for an Ebola outbreak was 1,600 sequences, but we now have 4 million sequences or, or approaching 5 million globally. Um, and so ideally when we would retrieve sequences from the local trust, we'd like to then regenerate that entire tree of millions of sequences with the extra you know, four or five or 10 or 20 that we've just sequenced. That's not really computationally feasible. And so during the pandemic, part of what COG UK did was to develop new techniques to allow basically the projection of, of the extra sequences into the existing pre-calculated tree, which is done sort of, you know, sort of every other day on, on the sort of central systems within COG. And what this allows us to do is find relationships that previously we didn't even know exist. So it may be that there's been an outbreak and five patient samples have been collected from one particular trust connected to that outbreak, but actually there could be other people that are also connected to that outbreak that were from samples we sequenced in prior weeks from that trust, or perhaps a patient or a healthcare worker could have moved, um, or it could also be related to stuff in the community. Uh, and it's basically that technique by putting all of these genomes into one central database allows us to find these sort of hidden, um, previously unknown interactions. And so the tool which was presented this morning that we use for this, I probably don't have to explain too much about this, was called CIVIT, Cluster Investigation and Virus Epidemiology Tool. And this is the work of um, the Rambo Group at Edinburgh University. And again, it's a tool that didn't exist. 
uh, prior to the pandemic. So you know, really within the first few weeks of pandemic, the entire research group were told to drop everything and this tool was created. But what was really nice is one of the key users of this tool very early on is we were able to shape the development of the tool. So by suggestions and feedback of how we would used it, they sort of changed the way things worked. And in fact, we're, we're, we're named in the credits of this program. So it was really neat to be one of the first people in the world to use this tool to support infection control. But the important point about this tool, and I'll show you an example of some of its output later, is that we can only really track what's going on if we've got metadata with, with information on it. And so to that end, metadata was actually a huge part of the project. So genomics surveillance itself, is, as I say, is only really useful if we have information, ideally a link to the uh, medical records by some kind of unique ID. Uh, also the age, sex and location are really important for sort of global surveillance as well. But actually routinely, uh, it was mostly me who was having to collect all this information, we would collect 56 different fields for every single sample. So it can include relatively run of the mill things like sort of age, sex, et cetera. But it's actually all the information about where the swab was taken on the individual, what type of swab it was, their out of post, but obviously we can't disclose the full one, what hospital they were from, whether they were admitted to ICU, whether they're a healthcare worker, is the sample from a care home or the care home resident or a care home worker, and various things like that, including all of the details of the, the PCR test, test kit, as well as all the stuff that we do as well. So the type of sequencing we used, even the serial number of the, of the, the sequencer, the flow cell, and also details of the informatics pipeline. So all of that metadata is collected. And this is a, a kind of a redacted plot of what we get out of Civit. And you saw some of these this morning. So normally up against the tree, we'd have a whole bunch of IDs and, and things and labels. And so this actually isn't, um, this, is an, this is an investigation that we were involved in. It's actually a, a prison somewhere within the UK. Uh, and so all the interesting details are gone. It's not actually a hospital. But what's really neat about this, and you can see, so all of the, the query sequences are the red dots that are rooted into the tree here. And then we have two extra columns that represent two different tranches of data. So the first one is blue if you're inmate and red if you're a, a warden. Um, so you can see that we have one prison warden on there. Um, but the, the final column, which is different colors there on the right hand, so it's starting at green, that's actually the wing of the prison. And what's really interesting here is that the, the different sort of clades of the tree, the different branches of the tree, pretty much precisely correlate with the wing. And what that shows is that the sort of spread within the wing was introduced once into the wing, and then everyone else on the wing subsequently caught it from that one incident. And we see similar patterns in wards in hospitals as well, but this is just a, a very clear cut case. Um, and what's interesting actually is there's, there's, a, there's a green, um, green wing. Um, at the very top, and it's also at the bottom. So it's actually got two different distinct lineages of the virus spreading around simultaneously. And this plot would normally be more informative. So there were things like the locations and whether people worked in kitchens and what have you, and things like that there. But you can also see that where there's completely straight lines, it's what we call in file genetics a polytomy. So particularly in the middle of the diagram here where we've got the, the red wing, that straight line means that all of those individuals have an identical copy of the genome. The, the sequence is identical. So they really genuinely have all caught the virus from each other. But the interesting thing is, of course, you can see in some individuals, the, the diagram branches out and each little notch on the branch is one single nucleotide variant difference. And so in that sense, the virus is self barcoding. Most of the changes that it accumulates um, are probably benign. They don't really change the coding regions of the proteins. But by virtue of that, if that person then meets someone else, they then inherit their changes and so on. So you can, you can build up a quite complicated map of whom infected whom. And the, the rather neat thing about this plot is you can see that the sum nodes on this plot aren't large red squares. Those are other sequences which turned out to be um, either prisoners who were infected who, who weren't part of the study but whose samples were collected or the spouses of, of um, wardens you know, who have who, you know, been sequenced by a different route and picked up by Pella 2. So, it can basically locate people into individual households by virtue of the similarity of the virus, which is a very powerful technique. So moving on from this, and Yuzi will talk about this too, we were also involved in another study called Hoki, which has been mentioned briefly this morning, the hospital on onset COVID-19 infection clinical trial for, for long. Um, and this was just sort of headed up by UCL, by Judy Brewer. So we partnered with Yuzi at the Freeman to do this. And this required yet more metadata collection uh, specifically sort of, you know, admission dates and ward locations. And Sherelle was also involved in providing all of this uh, from the Freeman as well. Um, so, so again, a whole extra set of metadata. And the aim was 
was to formally, rather than just do it sort of, you know, in terms of when we're asked or when we thought there was a problem, was to formally track all of this stuff and generate reports where we had hospital acquired infections. So we had a, both a slow phase and a rapid phase, and the, the timeline is down there at the bottom. Uh, and during rapid phase, we had to turn around from receiving the samples to producing the report in 48 hours. So there was a lot of work in this. So we had to collect samples pretty much daily from the hospital in the van. We had to sequence the samples. We also had to work up the 56 fields of POG metadata for all those samples. We then had the extra Hokey metadata, as well as we had to keep our own internal tracking of which samples had arrived when, because they've got deadlines associated with them and they're a higher priority than other samples. So on top of this, we then had to do the informatics. So we sequence the virus, we align all the reads back to the genome to generate a consensus sequence of that virus. And that would be, as, as we would normally submit that into COG via normal mechanisms, also had to anonymize the important patient metadata from Hokey. Then, because of the, the way Hokey worked, we have to make sure we select out a higher quality uh, set of genomes that have at least 90% coverage of the entire genome. And we also have to generate a background. So we took a 50 mile radius around the Freeman of samples from the previous four weeks of both pillar one and pillar two in the community. And then these would be loaded into it. Uh, so we we'd do the background generation on a, a server based in Birmingham, but we'd then load it into a separate Hokey uh, instance on a, a server located in Cardiff. And then we run the Hokey sequencing report tool, which would generate this esoteric JSON file, um, which we then had to um, de-anonymize before we could, we, could, we could share it with people because it was generated in an anonymized way. Um, we also had to sort of inject extra information into it and then convert it into an HTML report. And then we had to meet with the infection control team and explain all of this and what we found. Of course, there were a number of gotchas here. And we also produced a civic report because that was also useful as well. So the first thing was is that this background generation, the code UCL had written, actually was really quite slow. And I re-implemented that for a 60-fold speed up. So instead of taking three hours to generate the background um, you know, catchment area, we get it down to three minutes. And this was really useful. This code then got redistributed throughout the project because people in London were having issues where the background generation was taking you know, over 12 hours. And so getting that down to 12 minutes was excellent for them. Uh, but it, when you've only got a 48-hour turnaround, this is quite critical. Uh, we also had to develop our own code for anonymizing the report based on the metadata systems we had locally. And so my PhD student, Matt, basically brought a whole bunch of code for sort of hashing all of the important clinical data and then turning that back into, into real data the end once we retrieve the file. But of course, the problem was is that all of this procedure, which involves collecting samples, people working in the lab, collecting metadata from clinical colleagues, all of this we had to do within 48 hours. So I think at the time, and many people who were shared our Teams chat will know that my state of mind probably at this time was, was kind of reflected by, by this meme, um, because we had to track all of this and make sure it was all on time. But we survived, and it all worked very well. So just sort of some sort of closing remarks, really, here about the utility of genomics and infection control. And these are the sorts of questions, I think Darren alluded to these things. And again, I didn't want to show individual reports from trust. I don't think it's right to go over those. Um, but these are the sort of things that, by looking at these trees, and again, we became, over the course of the pandemic, experts in interpreting these sort of trees. These sort of questions we could answer. So, you know, which patient infected what patient? And that was particularly, you were able to do that if you had timelines associated with when the samples were taken and when they started developing symptoms. Were there any staff members involved? Um, did this inspection, did the infection spread to other wards or was it just contained in one ward? Often the case that you would have more than one outbreak or you'd have outbreaks in different wards, but were they related to the same original source of the infection or were they different like the, the wings in the, in the, in the prison? Were they different you know, your movements of people into those wards? Um, and, and equally, there were, were outbreaks that we saw that were, that were over a period of weeks. And in some cases, it was the continuation of the same infection spreading around the, the, the location or the trust or hospital or whatever. But in other cases, there were actually different separate isolated outbreaks, which, which were caused by different individual lineages. I think in one example, we had three or four different lineages spreading around a, a location at the same time. So in terms of infection control reporting that allowed you to close down outbreaks or separate off things from being connected. Um, and, and these ultimately fed back to sort of um, you know, understanding how and, and why things spread around a location. Uh, I guess I can't speak for how these reports were acted on in a clinical setting. Perhaps Yisri can, can talk more about that. But 
the other thing that was really really quite amazing is that where we did get patients we'd often realize that we'd pull in their spouse um, from the pillar two sequencing so their spouse would have presented at a, at a drive through testing center and where the, where the patient was on the tree there would be an identical sequence in a little thing and that would just be their household or it might have involved several members of the household so that was a re real surprise didn't expect to be able to do that so um that that's really everything i was going to talk about but just to acknowledge I, I was, Darren's probably already said this, but this was the team at the Thurnborough, um, including Jimmy, who was a great help on the computer side of things, and all the people we've worked with uh, and the funders, as well as, of course, HBBE, who, who funded the two sequences we did most of the work on as well. So um, thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Still awake. Um, this is going to be less science. Um, thank you so much for organizing this um, fantastic event, and I'm honored to be here with you. The COG UK hospital onset um, COVID 19 infection trial is a subsidiary and one of the studies under the COG UK, but it's a unique study. Um, it's perhaps the first of its kind in history that uses the um, genome sequence as an intervention. Um, the study was sponsored by, um, or by the University College London uh, through their CCT or Central uh, Trial, uh, Clinical Trial Unit, and is funded by uh, UKRI. And uh, as I said, Dr. Brewer, uh, yeah, Judy Brewer was the um, uh, chief investigator. And by the way, she's my doctorate uh, supervisor when, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to talk to you about the study itself uh, for those who um, for the first time to hear about it today, and also just give you a, you know, a bit of insight, uh, you know, about the experience we had here uh, from this site. Uh, before I finish with two uh, case histories um, that will just demonstrate what um, um, Matthew just um, 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 described to you. So this is a, a prospective study, um, um, and you know. Uh, you know, the intervention, you know, in terms of, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, clinical trials, in the simplest uh, form, there's a treatment arm and a control arm, a comparator um, that uses just a placebo or standard treatment or um, another um, type of treatment uh, to compare. So the intervention here is really to use the sequencing to see whether that can impact on um, preventing the spread of the COVID-19 agent uh, within uh, UK hospitals. Um, so um, um, the intervention itself, as I said, and we mentioned before, is the availability of that sequence, the availability of that um, um, SRT. Um, and if it is delivered within 48 hours, that is our treatment arm. If it's delivered later than that, like five days or more, that is a comparator. Um, so the infection control team will do whatever they've been doing for the last few decades without the benefit of the sequence. I mean, we always have the sequences um, for infectious disease outbreaks, but we normally get them kind of retrospectively rather than prospectively. Um, so um, the, there are quite a few outcomes that were intended or expected from this trial. Um, primary, secondary, or exploratory, uh, quite a few lists. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the main primary outcomes were just to determine the incidence rate of, um, uh, you know, nosocomial infections as defined by infection control methods in the hospital. And also to, dis to, to determine that incidence rate when we add the sequence. So any um, hospital acquired infections that were missed by the normal conventional ways that the sequencing had uncovered. Not only the cases, but also we were after the incidence of outbreaks um, within hospital, either defined by IPC or defined by IPC plus sequencing. And also we looked at the changes that um, the IPC action, um, you know, will benefit when the sequence is received within 48 hours or retrospectively, what ideally could have been done if we had received the, the, the sequence earlier. And for that, we used so many forms for the trial and our research nurses were filling these um, forms at different stages of, um, of the trial. When the patient is you know, recruited, 
when the sequence was sent away, when the sequence came back, what the efficient control have done, and these are all filled in in forms that will be sent later to, 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 to the study. Um, we were one of 14 um, centers in the UK. Um, and essentially, there are three phases. Um, and you have maybe heard now this morning, rapid phase, slow phase. These are the you know phase two and phase three. Phase one is the phase where we have got the background and this is the time when Masi was trying to develop this hideous, you know, um, it's a bespoke system and it's been done somewhere else, but for, for you to do it here, he has to know how many walls we have in the Freeman, how many bays we have in the RVI, and to map all these together to come up with, 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 with a tool at the end. So at that time, we recruit a patient because we, we suspect the patient has got a hospital onset infection. He's been with us for at least 48 hours in the hospital before they were diagnosed. And then we take the sample, we send it to um, uh, the sequencing hub with the metadata that goes with it. And when the sequence is done, easy, it goes into the climb um, um, depository. Um, we don't receive the, 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 the sequence report. In the second um, and third phase, rapid or slow, the same thing happened, but this time, um, we have more extensive data that was, you know, augmented beside the COG UK normal metadata. And um, I've, this is this is unpublished um, data from the trial. I'm, I, I cannot, unfortunately, give you any results of the trial because it's being analyzed as we speak now, and I've anonymized the the sites. But I just showed you the Newcastle. We have recruited like 40 patients, and that is not because we are good. In infection control, we've got few patients. I mean, yeah, we are possibly the best, but that, that is not maybe the, the main reason. But um, I just wanted to show you this is the same timeline that um, Matthew showed you earlier. And somebody in the morning said, uh, uh, Anthony Fauci said, it's the virus that dictates the timeline, not us. Um, you could see here from in this in this graph that we started our baseline phase in December. Possibly that, that is the worst time any year to start anything in December, as if you're working in NHS and the hospital. But that was a different December from any other December. Beginning of the month, they lifted the lockdown for the second one, and within days, the Delta, or the, the Alpha variant came along and just took over our lives. And the politicians and board, so everybody was chasing that up, upstroke of the of, of the graph. You know, um, three tier system, if you remember, restrictions, tougher restrictions, at the end culminated in a lot of lockdown by the 7th of January. That is the time when you're doing the stool samples. So while you are trying to set up things for, for the hockey and for ourselves, we couldn't have done anything really if the numbers, uh, if you if you're even ready for, for more than the 40 patients that we've done. Anyway, by the time we started the um, uh, slow phase, which is February, beginning of February, end of, uh, of January, we had far less patients on the wall. And by the time we reached the third um, phase, which was the, for us, was the rapid phase, um, which we delayed, we, we mixed it just to be able to cope. There were very, very few cases on the walls. And that's why um, that complain things, that, that complicate things. So that's just uh, an idea for you to see. And all of you know how by April, when we are doing the last phase, the incidence of the uh, virus um, kind of change. So in the trial, we have got these four fantastic teams, the infection control team in the hospital, the research team in the hospitals, the clinical virology infection disease team, and of course, the Northumbria team. So these are the four teams, and each one of these have got tens of people working within it. Um, but um, we've got three or four people from each one of these teams forming the trial group um, that Matthew mentioned that we meet ultimately and discuss what we, we come out with. Um, so the people who started this idea have got this logic model of utilizing the sequence, the virus sequence, and looking and finding an insight into any specific patient with a hoke and try to um, work a change that bring out the outcomes that were we set out to, to do. And that, you know, not only that, we could maybe also perhaps find more um, uh, beneficial outcomes that we were not expecting. But that is easy said than done because 
Um, there are so many dependencies. Uh, so you know, the context is very important. Um, how the tool itself is developed, how it is delivered, how it's interpreted. These all have to be built into the system. And I wish I had time just to discuss that. But um, I'm, I'm very happy that um, Matthew actually covered a lot of how these difficult. And you spoke only, Matthew, about the SRT. But the dependencies otherwise of how things are done on the wards um, is also complex. Um, the more complex things, however, is not just the fact that we have got different sites. Patients are in the RBI, the labs in the Freeman, the teams themselves are between two, and the sequencing hub in, here in university. But the biggest thing is definitely the data. Uh, I felt sometime that Matthew uh, and, 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 and Darren going to be, you know, we gave up on you, you know, wh where, are this, where, is, where is the data? Data is being absolutely difficult. And these 60 columns that um, uh, Matthew was talking about, they have to be derived from four or five different uh, systems. So for every patient, you have to go for many, many different systems to know where they are, when they were admitted. For example, when they start, did they go to ICU? How many times did they move from one place to another place? So, and that was a big thing. So I'm just going to finish by showing you two cases. Um, this is an outbreak that um, we, you know, a real outbreak um, that, um, and these are cases within Hoke. Okay, so we had um, a patient called um, Index F1 lady who was with us for a week, then diagnosed with COVID. Um, she had one other contact, F1 contact, um, and uh, within the diagnosis of that lady, there were like nine cases within 12 days in the ward. So as far as we're concerned, that was an outbreak by the definition of official control. But what we see, are we going to change that when we um, have the sequence or, uh, or not? Um, there was another patient called M1, and he got a contact in his bay. He did a different base, but the same ward. And we had a third patient called F2, who had three contacts um, on a third um, um, uh, um, bay. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at this from the viewpoint of F2, contact one, this person, because we've got, um, as you can see here in the sequence column, um, we have got SRT, which is the 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 the, um, the report itself, the proper report, um, in three patients, but we also had a civet report in two, while three others, the, the sequence just failed and we couldn't find any results. So let's look at this person who's um, uh, here. So that's the report. It's twelve two four um, zero four nine, and you could see. Um, on, you know, in the in the graph below here, that this is the focus patient in this diamond, but there are three patients whose um, sequence is identical to that patient. Okay, um, these patients are these two. Okay, um, so in fact they are the, these two, two patients who got SRT as well. Okay, and that kind of vindicated and confirmed the impression by the infection control that this is indeed one cluster of cases. But we had a third patient here who has an identical um, sequence, who was not mentioned anywhere. And we didn't know who that patient is um, at all. Um, and he, he appears here. When we looked at his details, we found that he was actually diagnosed on the day of admission. So he couldn't have been infected in the, or, you know, anywhere. And we don't know actually whether he was on that ward or not. But when we look carefully after de-anonymizing the, the, the results again and see who that patient is, we found that he was actually on that ward, but he was not included because he came from emergency department straight away to a side room, isolation. So the infection control assumed that he could have never been involved with anything because he was in isolation. So how that happened, we don't know, but his sequence brought him, you know, directly with, with the rest of the outbreak that is happening in the war. Um, not only that, when we got the civet reports, we found that the two patients who had the civet reports actually clustered fully in the same line, like the one that Matthew showed you, with the rest. And that showed us, um, confirmed to us that this is one cluster and 
as a bonus, we found that there was a staff on the same ward, because normally we didn't know when we received the samples or the results where the staff are. Um, but with help from occupational health, we found that staff um, was working on the same unit and you could see when he was diagnosed or she was diagnosed. So that was a link. The twist was that there was an, an eighth patient who was not here, who was included in the trial, uh, in, the, in the cluster by infection control methods, but his sequence was completely different. So he was infected somewhere else and he's got nothing to do with this and his bay did not have to be closed like other bays while the others were closed. Um, and this is during the slow phase of the study. So whatever we have done, we had looked at this, you know, retrospectively because it wasn't in the, in the rapid phase. Last example, this is um, a, a, a child who had got a, a hospital acquired or hospital onset infection. And we just looked at their sequence um, specific way. And, um, and we found that there were four um, um, samples that have got identical sequences. Two of them are from that same child, um, collected two weeks apart. Uh, but there was another child who was in that unit two weeks earlier um, and had since went to ICU, um, clustered fully with that one. Um, and a fourth one, and that fourth one was a mystery because that child wasn't in the hospital in the first place. He was in the outpatient. So how could that sequence bring these um, children together? But the fact that he's a child and he's a, a cancer child and that ward was a cancer ward, we thought, mm, what is happening here? More investigation found that this child was actually in the hospital 10 days before and he was discharged home. Um, but the power of the sequencing brought all these together and we had now found that actually there was a series where this child was on the ward at the same time with the child who went to ICU subsequently and the four and the three children were involved in one outbreak. Um, the bonus here was that we found in Matthew's report more um, sequences that are very similar but they are different by one or two bases at a time over the next month or so from the child who went to ICU. It's a bone marrow transplantation, a leukemia child um, whose spike gene kept changing with accumulating mutations. And that was quite frightening for us and for the child. And that um, finding had an impact on how that child was treated. Um, it was treated with ECMO um, on ICU and um, um, the child made it. Um, and the, these findings were very instrumental in the way uh, experimental medicines were brought specifically with that child because because it needed to be treated. So that is a, a general, um, really quick outlook of how the hook have worked um, um, in reality. It's a unique experience, cross institutions work, just brilliant, innovative trial. And um, I think the concept is proven and also unintended outcomes for clinical outcomes are also observed. Um, but the results are being analyzed now and, and hopefully all of you are gonna be reading it um, in general of um, your choice um, very, very soon. Thank you very much. Can I share screen? Yes, hang on. Can someone, can someone got a laptop tell them yes? Hang on. Is he allowed to? Yes, I am allowed yeah. to. I'm trying to select the window. Get there. Can you see that? Yep. Right. Over here and hi. Uh, does it? Can everybody see that? Just in case this is remote. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Cool. Like you, you can see from the large number of people that what I'm about to talk about is depend, has arisen from a great deal of activity by a great, from a great number of people. And I'm here just reporting on upscaling, as it were, to modeling. And I'm going to pick on the epidemiology of, epidemiology of the disease on side during the year 2020 to give you an indication of what I think was going on uh, in this region. And I'll give you some background first. So you can see me sort of sitting halfway down the middle here, but there's a great number of people involved with uh, developing this, and there are probably people missed off this on my pad. So go to the next slide. This is some background of what I've been doing on COVID, and it helps to put things into perspective in relation to what subsequently was done on, on T side. We, we analyzed a load of putative cases from across the EU using mixed effect models we, with a view to looking at how interventions might have uh, impacted on the pattern of disease in individual countries. And we were able to predict pretty much uh, how a number of cases varied through time in relation to the uh, interventions. And somewhat unusually, we uh, found that the closure of educational facilities, at least during this first um, four, 50 weeks of the, um, of the, of the outbreak, um, was the one factor that seemed to be restricting uh, spread or had an impact on spread. And stay at home orders and closure of additional non essential businesses were not, in the, were not independently adding anything to that impact. So we've got pretty much the pattern of the first wave, right? That's big scale, country scale. Now then we need to shift Lauren and see what's going on in that, uh, within country. And I think this is where we start to come across interesting variation. And I'm going to talk about Norfolk here, which is something I investigated because I had access to a lot more information about the demography of the people. And you can see that excess, this is risk, relative risk of being a case or, in, or excess risk of being a case in particular areas of, uh, North, of Norfolk, which is the bulgy bit on the east coast of England down south, if anybody is unfamiliar with it. And you can see here that this is the central town of Norwich, the city that is, it, it, it's pretty much the, it's the county town or county city for Norfolk. And you can see that areas around the town uh, were areas of high risk. And these are areas of actual deprivation. Um, this is a place uh, in, in North Norfolk called Sheringham, where a lot of older people lived. And when we analyzed this more closely, we were able to disentangle the relative contribution of um, a background demography to death through cases. So we had a rural effect that was quite slight, but we had a, a bed, a care home capacity which had a reduced effect on cases. Population, obviously, the higher the density of population, the more cases. But deprivation kicks in. People of over 65 live in deprived areas in Norfolk, and it had a, 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 this has an not ongoing effect through the number of over 65s on the dead. This structural equation modeling approach is actually quite useful in being able, allowing you to disentangle the relative contributions of what might be confounding variables in the background. So, we can take this one stage finer in scale. And we, there was also considerable variation in how different communities were affected. And this is an analysis of care homes. And here we were able to split um, when, how a disease got into a care home and then its subsequent spread. So here we have that the, um, the number of care workers serving in the care home was a major factor determining whether the um, whether the care home went down with disease. This is a survival analysis and we're using actually the, the introgression of disease as the, as the response variable. And you can see that in smaller care homes with fewer care workers, the introgression of disease was quite small. Once it got in, however, we can shift over to this plot here, we can see what we already knew perhaps, that PPE, lack of PPE, um, was a major factor increasing the risk of spread in there. Uh, and obviously the disease increased through time and care workers, as we found over here, tended to spread the disease, as did nurses. So we've got this in introgression and then ongoing spread, which is linked very much to uh, how the, stru the structure of the system that's being investigated. So that's big picture, um, how shall I say, um, no lineage information. Can we learn anything more fundamental about the epidemiology from more fine scale analysis of what lineages were involved in local disease? And I think this is an interesting question because the broad brush information that we got on spread in countries and then spread in, in, in um, 
in, in individual areas of Norfolk, for instance, doesn't capture the underlying epidemiology. And we might get more if we look at spread in relation to what lineages are going on because lineages were involved because in effect, we've got a dynamic process of invasion across uh, the population, but we've got this popping up of new lineages within it, which should give us a forensic approach to investigating how disease was spread. So we use mixed effect modeling and uh, risk disease mapping to investigate this. This is Teesside and, for, and this is where Darren and his group collect, collected a very substantial amount of data on uh, um, the positive cases from both pillar one and pillar two tests over, the, over, over 2020. So it's an area of Northeast England with substantial variation in population density. This is Middlesbrough, obviously Hartlepool up here. And these are rural areas up in the North York Moors. Um, so there's substantial variation in population density, higher around here, lower out here and out here. And there's a mixture of rural and urban landscapes, rural out here and out here. But much of this is post-industrial. And so we have a sort of a paradigm community really, which has high levels of socioeconomic deprivation in here, higher levels, but lower levels of deprivation around here. And we've got a microcosm as it were, in which to look at disease. So what was the pattern of COVID disease on T-sites? Well, we have positive tests for COVID on T-sites. They did not emerge early in the epidemic. This is, this is interesting in terms of considering the interventions later. So we had access to data recording postal locations and timings of positive tests for pillar one and pillar two testing schemes across that region. I'll just go back to that slide to point out one other thing. Our aerial unit is the postcode sector, the first four digits of the postcode. This allowed anonymity, and this is the de 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 depth of spatial scale at which the information was recorded. So the data consists of records of positive tests for pillar one and pillar two schemes. We had the date of the positive test and we had the outgoing postcode and lineage identified by PCR. In fact, all of Matt's work. So what are the trends across T side? Well, we've interposed the interventions, uh, national lockdown, regional tier two, regional tier three and hosp hosp hospitality promotion over the summer. And this is the breakdown in cases of what well, positive tests all combined, pillar one and pillar two. And it's obvious that during intervention one, cases seemed to decline, but then the subsequent interventions had a lesser effect, particularly the regional tier three effect here. And this is the distribution of pillar one and pillar two, uh, and with an obvious and early establishment of pillar one cases, following by the gradual uptake of pillar two. As there were more, as, as there was more community spread, so we need to move from description um, to prediction and inference. Can we do anything with the information, the demography that we have, to identify what influence trends in positive tests? So this is an interesting problem statistically, because we have a spatially spatio-temporally dynamic problem, where positive tests arrive arise in defined areas. That's the first thing. So we've got space and time varying at the same time. This tends to uh, upset statistics, but we'll come back to that. And areas are contiguous with each other. So one might expect that they're not independent of each other as, as people move from one postcode to another. And obviously, because it's a contagious disease, areas with positive tests are likely to have more cases in subsequent time periods. So we've got a spatial dependency here, and we've got a temporal dependency in what we see in the data. How do we analyze this? Well, the first thing we do is look at risk and time series. So here is the risk of becoming positive in, in relation to the postcodes. And you can see it's low, it's below one for all the rural areas, and it's particularly high for TS5, which is, um, an area of urban, a highly urban area. This low area here, incidentally, is the um, post-industrial landscape of Teesside, butting onto the, um, the Hartlepool Harbour, um, where there's not a lot of land and there's not a lot of people and there's quite a lot of nature reserve, if I remember rightly. So we might expect that to be low anyway. So how do cases relate to the demography present? I use tests and cases interchangeably here, but suffice to say. The total population, as you'd imagine, is higher in these urban postcodes around Middlesbrough and Stockton. 
lower in the uh, in, 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 um, in the rural areas around Darlington in North Yorkshire. But then now look at deprivation. The deprivation score here is the basically the proportion of the population that's in the 10th decile of deprived areas. Now there are 36 and a half thousand scores of deprivation that list for the different areas of the UK and a large proportion of the population of Teesside, particularly in these areas, um, here are, are highly deprived. So in some cases, more or less 100% of people living in this area are in the 10th decile of deprivation. That is really poor. And we look at the cases again, and we can see that they're not in the area up there because the population is quite small, but we have this higher risk again in Middlesbrough. So it appears to be a risk higher in areas of high population density with high deprivation, which I guess we probably expect. So do demography and interventions impact on cases? Well, we use this, what's called a negative binomial mixed effects model with postcode as random effect. Now, what does that mean? Well, a mixed effect model allows us to uh, adjust for the differences between postcode. And we're adjusting and we're doing, it, it's a sort of a time series analysis or regression analysis. We're assuming that the population of cases obey the negative binomial distribution. Now you're going to say, why should I bother doing that? Well, one of the things about disease is it's aggregated and the negative binomial distribution is a really good way of modeling um, aggregation as we expect the cases to be aggregated in time. And so our variables that we use to try and explain this variation in case of positive tests, we can see that temperature had a negative effect, uh, significantly so. So the hotter it was, the fewer the cases, we'd expect that people were outside. However, in contrast, and perhaps unexpectedly, rainfall had a negative effect too. The first lockdown had a positive effect on, on cases. Now, this is utterly bizarre, but it comes back to the um, it comes back to two things, I think, relating to timing of intervention and timing of disease in the country. We've put in this plus two weeks here because we've lagged cases by two weeks in order to um, adjust for the fact that there might be some time delay in reporting illness. Week of year means it's a progressive increase through year, as we'd expect, and tier two had another, also had a positive effect. And as we anticipated from our pictorial representation of risk in the last slide, we've got um, increased deprivation, increases the um, level of disease, and as the level of disease is higher in uh, populations with higher density. So we're getting some indication now of, of, of being able to model the disease or the case, positive cases. And we can see that if we look at the individual postcodes, we get a lot of noise, as might be expected, but we do capture the major trends in particular postcodes. And you can see just barely looking at this, that some postcodes, TS12 and TS13 had relatively no numbers of cases, TS17 and TS5 were all over the place. Um, and the fitted model is the red and the observed data, which are much more noisy, obviously, are, are the blue. So this, is ma this matches what we expected from other spatial modeling. So in, uh, in, in Norfolk and, and indeed in probably the care homes. But what, 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 what about the lineages concerned on Teesside? Well, the, the very surprising thing for me as soon as I got the data was to find there were 86 different lineages recorded over the 52 weeks of 2020. However, these sort of popped up and then disappeared again. Um, and only eight were recorded frequently enough to allow analysis. And these appeared at different times in the epidemic. So we had our, um, starting off with two uh, lineages, 111 and 11119, which were knocked out pretty much by the first intervention, or apparently so. <coughs> they did not, this is lockdown one, they did declined. Then we get this spread again after week 30 in the year as large, more lineages turn up. And we've got this B1, B117, I think it's Kent, Kent variant, is the one that took off in the subsequent, in, in, the, in, in, new, in new year. So this would be December 2020. So we've got patterns of increase and decrease all over the place. Um, and it's not very clear there. So 
The first question people I've, I'm expecting to be asked is, you pull pillar one and pillar two lineages together. And I thought this is a major thing I need to challenge. Um, and the, the sources of um, pillar one and pillar two tests differed and they start at different points in the epidemic. <coughs> so they may not be equally representative of the disease spread within the wider community since they were separate, actually sampling two different communities in reality. However, if we took the period of the, when the two pillars were running together later in the epidemic, the relative numbers recorded in each lineage in each pillar were strongly correlated. So what we got in the community was also seen in what we got in pillar one. Suggests that the two pillars were sampling the same patterns of disease and lineage dynamics when they were running concurrently. So where did they occur? Now this is quite fascinating. There, of the <coughs> uh, eight lineages, we were able to map the excess risk associated with a positive test for that particular lineage across the different postcodes. And there was much spatial variation in risk of being a positive test for each lineage, although they usually centered on the urban environment, TS5, for instance. What seems to have happened when we looked at it this in time, and we're not going to do this here, it, there seems to be a, a starting off in the center of the town and then moving off in random directions. So some B315, for instance, goes off up north, whereas B117, 177 goes out eastwards towards York, towards Yorkshire. So why is this the case? Well, it's slightly more problematic. We don't really have enough data to analyze uh, in the same way that I did here, because we've got too many zeros. So trying to tease out what's going on with the individual lineages is, is, is more complicated. So what I did was to treat lineage as a random effect. This would mean that I expect the different lineages to behave differently, but they would differ from the common mean. That's the purpose of using a random effect. The common mean is the, what we'd expect, which is what we got in the previous statistical model. But we want to know whether lineages deviate from this um, pattern. So the timing of occurrence was, that's a, just another way of showing the map, showing the plot. I was intending to try and show this as time since the emergence of the lineage in the UK and haven't been able to get data because they seem to conflict. Uh, Matt, one of them appears to have the first case way after it appeared on T side. Suffice to say, most of these lineages were brought here. And I think that goes back to the fact that Middlesbrough is a central hub for communication with the rest of the world. Of the world. So there'll be traffic from the south, etc and commute, commuting and et cetera, outwards from the, from the main center where business would be undertaken. So can we have, if given that there is spatial variation in the spread of different lineages, are there any underlying causes? Well, if we now model the lineages of individuals within this model, we get a more restricted set of covariates. And the first lockdown has a slightly negative effect, although it's not really, only just marginally significant with that. We get the progressive increase with time and we still got the same issue with the level of deprived population within each postcode and of course the same with the total population. So in effect, and now we've got temperature increase in the disease. Interestingly, I used a zero inflated model because there are loads of points going back to this where there's a lot of zeros and you can't model zeros with normal statistics very easily. So we used a zero inflation model and that allowed us to basically indicate that individual lineages popped up at different times in the year so that we got a better fit actually of the model. That's again, the final point of this slide is the population and deprivation of the key drivers here. However, if we looked at the values for the random effects of weak, which is effectively a measure of rate of spread, that would be the average rate of spread or average rate of increase, sorry. Then we get this picture that these three lineages have a much faster rate, particularly this one, have a much faster rate of increase in positive tests than these other ones. Um, and 
we've yet to find out what this is, but it's, it, it must be linked in some way to transmissibility and decoupling the relative contributions of those that makes it, makes it difficult to understand. So what do I conclude? Well, up to now, this is still ongoing work, but the rate of increase in positive tests on T-side was related to population density, deprivation and weather. The rates of spread differed by lineage. The spatial pattern and timing suggests that COVID, COVID came into the community from outside and that subsequent spatial spread amongst the other postcodes was opportunistic. And it's perhaps no surprise that national scale interventions did not match the time scales of the T-side epidemic, because I think the interventions would, were probably driven by perceptions of disease risk down in the southeast much before it had arisen in the north. And that is it. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for contributing to it, and I'll go back to the list of people. Cheers, thank you, Steve. Is there any questions for Steve? No, thank you, Steve. Thanks very much for that. We'll end the recording now. How do we end the recording? I end the meeting. Oh, yeah.